Cool. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is the Miniscript panel. Uh, my name is Rob Hamilton, co-founder and CEO of AnchorWatch, and we have with me today uh, Antoine uh, Ponsat from uh, the co-founder and CTO of Wizard Sardine, who make Liana Wallet, and we have Andrew Polstra, uh, the creator of Miniscript and the director of Blockstream Research. Okay, Miniscript. So looking through my notes, uh, the blog post formally announcing it was in September 2019. Uh, the initial code was pushed in 2018 that summer. Uh, I guess before we go into any details, what is Miniscript? Sure, so um, Miniscript is a way of encoding Bitcoin scripts or a way of decoding Bitcoin scripts, if you'd like, where the high-level policy, what you're actually trying to accomplish with this script, you're checking signatures, whatever, uh, is visible in a way that you can reason about, basically. So the problem that we had was Bitcoin script is a very low level, it's like a kind of an assembler language. It's based off of a language called fourth. The computational model of Bitcoin script is really not, it doesn't map to human level concepts at all, right? You don't think like, I'm checking a signature kind of thing. Right? You think, like, I'm pushing a series of bytes, and then I'm pushing another series of bytes, and then I have, like, an opcode that interprets them in a certain way, and I can rearrange them and, like, edit these bytes and so on. But what you're thinking of as a person is, I have a number of keys. I want these keys to, I want signatures associated with these keys. Uh, failing that, maybe there's a time lock, and then I have other keys kind of thing. So we would... Kind of, it was, it's been a, a fun game for us for the last many years to make fun of Ethereum for having this like Turing complete language that's impossible to reason about and stuff. But like the sad secret was that Bitcoin script was not Turing complete and also you can't reason about it. So like, it's not, not so great. So the idea behind Miniscript is that we wanted to be able to reason about scripts. We didn't want to fork, we didn't want to change it, invent a whole new script model. Like that would be a, a project that would be still continuing for decades to come. But, um, but we wanted to be able to reason about it. And we found this nice subset of Bitcoin script that it turned out you could kind of lift into this tree-like structure where you can just see the, the individual parts of your spending policy. So that's what Miniscript is. Yeah, it, basically it's a framework that gives you a safe way of using more general Bitcoin scripts. It gives you assurance about what your Bitcoin script semantics actually are. Because you could come up with a Bitcoin script that you think does what you think it does, but it does not actually do it. So it gives you assurance about what it does and that it does not do what you don't want it to do. So soundness and completeness. Yeah, and my elevator pitch is always saying, uh, Miniscript makes Bitcoin programmable money in a very accessible way. It's a very powerful tool to start involving more advanced um, security schemes for how you're securing your Bitcoin. And I actually left off the rest of that progress roadmap. Uh, Antoine, you did a lot of work that got merged into Bitcoin Core in February. So version uh, 25 coming out next will have full output descriptor and signing support for Miniscript. Right? Yeah, for, for Segwit v0, you see, uh, starting with Bitcoin Core 24.0, we already had watch only support, so you could import uh, Miniscripts in the Bitcoin Core wallet, but you could not sign, for, you could not spend the coins uh, sent to this wallet, but starting with 25, we'll, you'll be able to spend these coins, but it's only uh, within the WSH descriptor for now. That's right, which is a perfect segue for talking about uh, actually what would it take? Uh, Taproot changed many things and actually how Bitcoin script would be executed and it impacts Miniscript, right? So uh, offhand, you know, you have the uh, op check sigad instead of op check multisig and you have the minimal if rule. There's a couple arrangement things. What does that look like for um, enabling Taproot full functionality uh, for Miniscript as like next steps? Yep. So. Uh, well, well, Miniscript, a lot of the implementations are very new. The uh, original idea for Miniscript actually predates Taproot by a little bit. So when we were, um, we being, being several different people, were trying to figure out the rules for TapScript, uh, what should the scripting language look like in Taproot, uh, we were able to use some of the problem we had with Miniscript to inform that. Uh, so one that, uh, that Rob hinted at is this thing called the minimal if rule. So like the Bitcoin scripting language is really like a low level thing. We have this, uh, an if opcode where if something is true, then you, know, you do something, you check some keys or whatever, otherwise you do something else. And the way this opcode works is that you feed it an arbitrary pile of bytes, and if these bytes are truthy, in a sense that would take me a long time to describe, then you do the first thing, and if they're falsy, which also takes a long time to describe, 
then you do the other thing. And this is actually a source of malleability because these notions of truthy and falsy, uh, you can have truthy values and falsy values that are all arbitrary length. So naively, if you were to just try to use an if cop code and say, well, the user provides the true or false and then they apply, uh, provide the appropriate signatures, then somebody could take their true value, which is maybe just like the single byte one, and add a whole bunch of zeros in front of it, an arbitrary number, and now they've made the transaction 10 times bigger, and now they've ruined the fee rate, and you know, this is, this is very bad. So the Bitcoin network has what's called a policy rule where nodes won't forward transactions that have this, this, um, these kind of malformed truthy values. But because it's only a policy rule, you know, you can't, uh, transactions could get into blocks, like a miner could malleate this, or some malicious person uh, collaborating with a miner could, you know, still, still undermine your fee rate in these ways. So Taproot made this a consensus rule. So one thing we realized very early on with Miniscript is that basically we have to, we have to accept policy rules, right? Um, as much as we'd really rather depend on consensus, but it turns out if you don't accept the policy rules, like minimal if, it's hopeless. You can't even branch, right? You can't do anything with Bitcoin script. So Taproot did strengthen minimal if. I think there were a couple other small things like that where we kind of tightened up the rules in consensus to say like, you know what, this extra flexibility just basically lets you wreck transactions and it doesn't provide any extra, extra functionality. We also changed the way that we do multi-signatures. Uh, we have a new opcode called checksigad, um, and I'm, I'm not gonna um, describe these all in too much detail, but we added a, a few extra opcodes. And so we had to tweak Miniscript a little bit to use those new opcodes, but these are actually, technically speaking, fairly minor things to change. Uh, the more interesting thing is that we changed the way that um, denial of service limits in script are computed. So prior to Taproot, the rules for what kind of scripts are valid, uh, there are like 10 different limits that you need to care about. So there's something, there's a 201 opcode limit where opcodes don't include certain opcodes that just push, push data, but 201 there. There's a 20 sig op limit where this is a different set of opcodes that are limited by 20. There's a maximum script size you can have and there's actually scripts appear in multiple parts of the transaction. They all have different limits. There's a maximum number of stack elements you can have. There's like all these different limits. And with Miniscript, because we are all of a sudden able to produce general purpose programs that can do arbitrary things and maybe of arbitrary length, we found that when we were trying to write code for compilers that would take a policy and produce an optimal Miniscript, we couldn't, we had like every, every direction, we had a multi-dimensional optimization problem. We had all these different limits that we had to manage. And this is suddenly very hard, right? Ideally, we just have one limit, right? Basically, for every additional byte that you use, uh, you know, you have to pay a certain bit extra. And that's something that we can, it's very easy to optimize one value, right? You try to make it small. If you have multiple dimensions, you know, like, if I ask you, like, what's the smallest point in this room? There's not, there's not an answer, right? So with TapScript, we eliminate a whole pile of limits. And in particular, we said there's no more opcode limit. Okay, so opcode limit didn't really make sense given that you already have to pay for every opcode. And for SIGOPs, we said, well, SIGOPs are pretty expensive, so we'll just make them cost 50 bytes. And for a user, this actually doesn't really affect you because you already have um, a sig op involved a public key and a signature, and that's already more than 50 bytes. So you, you're already spending more than 50 bytes kind of thing. And so that was, that was the biggest, uh, I guess, pro mini script change that we made was to greatly simplify these limits uh, so, that, so that we could produce optimal scripts. And this is, I guess, an example of the kind of thing that until we had mini script, we couldn't even think about trying to optimize these things because script was such a, such a mess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well said. Yeah. Um, we have a very short panel, so a lot of things are being condensed. If you are interested in learning more, I would personally suggest um, Andrew did a really great bit devs in London in 2020. You can look that up on YouTube. It's my go-to reference for getting more into the details and all of these uh, landmines that happen with Bitcoin script if you're operating without many script. Uh, you were on Stefan Levera as well, right? Yeah, I've been on Stepan Rivera, and there's been a couple of uh, Bitcoin pull request review clubs that were organized, and the Miniscript integration into Bitcoin Core with some uh, questions and a summary about the whole questions that were posted during the meeting, so it could be a good resource. That's perfect, yeah, and I uh, did a Citadel dispatch earlier this year as well, so depending on how deep you want to go, there's plenty of extra content, but moving on to the next thing, it, it was yourself, Sanka and Peter, right, that put this all together. And it sounds like Sanka really like charged this up to really add a lot more efficiency in extending the use of Miniscript, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was kind of, kind of a funny history. It's, 
like quite surprising and flattering for me that like we're talking about Miniscript at this thing here. Because the history was basically that in 2018 or so, um, I was working on the Rust Bitcoin project, which is just like Bitcoin utilities for uh, in the Rust programming language. And some people wanted to add the ability to do more interesting things in script. And there were a few like standard templates people were using, right? There's like a single public key, there's a multi-sig, there's maybe like a multi-sig with a time lock was kind of a half standard thing that a lot of people were doing. And people wanted to add support for these things to, to Rust Bitcoin. And I said, well, no, I don't want all these templates here. I don't want to like script to the general purpose thing. You know, let's add general purpose scripting support. And Peter was kind of thinking about the same kind of things in Bitcoin Core, right? We just had kind of a, a, an ideological distaste for having templates when, when we, we have a general script system, right? And we realized that we could just take a bunch of script fragments and then like build a sub-language out of these fragments in certain ways. And then we like got into this real like kind of architecture astronaut kind of thing where like, oh, we can add a type system and we can make them fit together and, and stuff like this. But ultimately, it was just a way for us to make our own software look prettier to our own eyes kind of thing. And we were kind of like, can we do, like, what are people using Bitcoin script for? And, well, the majority is, is simple wallets and Lightning, basically. And Lightning is probably the only, at the time, the only complicated use of script. And we couldn't beat the efficiency of Lightning. But ours was prettier and more analyzable. So we were like, okay, that's a win, right? And then at, at Blockstream, we hired an intern, uh, Sankit. Sankit Kandelkar, um, and in the space of three months, he ramped up on Rust and on Bitcoin and on Miniscript, and the Miniscript compiler, which is actually like a whole project in itself, and he found some more fragments that were smaller than ours that would allow us to do smaller um, uh, public key encoding, uh, at least in the case that the, the, um, the public key isn't used, and that's, that's very common. You just have public keys that are there just in case, and then they don't get used, and doing that, all of a sudden, Miniscript was able to produce HTLC-like functionality. And it was actually smaller than the ones that are used by the Lightning Network uh, and by a pretty large margin. And so all of a sudden, Miniscript was um, something, like it wasn't just like a pretty thing, right? We could all of a sudden do a lot of stuff and we were able to beat the efficiency of Lightning. We were able to beat the efficiency of Liquid. Uh, so Liquid is a, is a side chain where you move coins into the custody of a federation and back. And, um, and we had an emergency script there that we, we spent quite a bit of time hand optimizing and then sank it, beat it. Um, and yeah, and it was, it was cool. And then also before it was Peter writing the stuff in C++ and me writing the stuff in Rust and we were both just individually playing with it. And all of a sudden having sank it, driving the compiler forward and stuff, we had some energy behind the project from a developer point of view. Um, and that's when it started to be like a thing with like a name and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um Talking about all this uh, low-level protocol and like deep in the details, you know, co-founded Liana. Like, uh, how do you guys leverage Miniscript to kind of bring it out to the larger audience, and what does this actually bring functionality to an everyday user in this room? Yeah, that's a good question because uh, how is well, Miniscript is now trending, um, so it's not hyped to discuss Miniscript, and I feel like sometimes it's been pushed like Miniscript for the sake of Miniscript was so. What we're trying to do with Liana is to have more, like take the full advantage of the possibilities of Bitcoin scripts for recovery purposes. So for inheritance or for different trade-offs between different backups. And we are using Miniscript as a tool for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's also partially what we're using Miniscript for as well, an idea of like a key hierarchy. So you can have a two of three multi-sig, but maybe you want to have one particular key must sign. Right, and you can, the inevitable question is, well, what happens if that person disappears who's required to sign? And Miniscript, the accessibility of Miniscript and being able to empower time locks in a very accessible way allows us to say, after a certain amount of time, if the key disappears, you can change that, right? So that's, with Liana, you can set up your systems in such a way where you have a three of five that becomes a two of five, right? Or you can, and these are just very quick examples, but it's really opening up the design space for what it is to do Bitcoin security in general. And now we've been seeing an uptick in hardware wallet support, which was, I think, Andrew, when I first reached out to you, like that was the biggest question was hardware wallet support and Ledger added it at the end of last year, and we've, it sounds like a lot more are coming now. Yeah. We've been harassing them for three years now. Uh, <laughs> they already spent it thanks to Salvatore and Gala, who led this project. Absolutely, I yeah, know. Um, Salvatore and Gala uh, championed it within Ledger and added this functionality in an incredible way to allow uh, this accessibility, and it's uh, very exciting. Uh, 
we talked to everyone on stage who are building wallets and now very soon this is gonna be adding more and more support which just adds to the distribution and accessibility for developers to use it and for users to actually be able to appreciate and leverage it in their own security. Um, I guess for other questions, uh, you wanted to have a conversation too about covenants for if we're to continue oh, yeah. changing uh, Miniscript. So we've kind of gone over what is Miniscript, the history of getting it up to this point, how we're maybe using it. For the future state, one, taproot integration, which as Andrew said is r relatively straightforward. What does it mean for uh, any sort of covenant, whether that's an op vault or op CTV or some other construction of a covenant, how does that change the design and orientation around Miniscript in general? Well, for, for op vault, it's maybe different, but then uh, Andrew can speak about the elements integration. Mm -hmm. But for op vault, basically, you might want to be sending your, uh, when you trigger which trial, you, you might want to be sending it to an arbitrary script and you might want it to be a Miniscript descriptor. Mm -hmm. It does not need to change Miniscript per se. But if you want to integrate some covenant primitives, such as the opcode that were enabled with the Tapcrate subcode in uh, elements, or such as CTV, for instance, this kind of things that becomes different and probably Andrew can think about. Yeah, um, right, exactly. If you're doing something just like a vault and you just wanna add a vault, like a closed vault functionality, then you can certainly do that, right? And you'd be, in some sense, outside of Miniscript. And we could add this as sort of like an alternate fragment that was a complete program to mi Miniscript or something like that. But you're a little bit back into the, you know, having a set of templates model. So if we wanted to integrate covenants in a general way with Miniscript, so you can imagine Miniscript where you can not only add arbitrary like time locks and signature checks and, and things like this, but you can also add covenant kind of restrictions and then build complicated things then the Miniscript model actually becomes kind of conceptually quite difficult to extend. And to illustrate this, the way that Miniscript works, so the key word behind Miniscript is composability. And what that means is that if you have some sort of Miniscript program, you can fit that into a larger program and recursively build kind of a, a larger thing. So if you want to have you know, some sort of, um, well imagine you're like a cosigner, maybe you're running like a BitGo-like company or whatever where you're willing to sign off on somebody else's arbitrary script. And the one rule that you care about as a cosigner is that the scripts that you're signing for, you know, they shouldn't be spendable without your signature, right? Because otherwise you're not actually providing any value and, and your name might well be attached to something that you actually have no control over. But ideally you would allow the counterparty to do whatever they want, right? You're just adding a signature to some arbitrary kind of thing. And with Miniscript, everything composes. So you can actually take whatever they're doing and your signature and use an and combinator, right? This has to be true and that has to be true. And the cool thing is that this and combinator doesn't actually care what you're putting into it, right? It will work, you kind of have a logical and, you also have logical ors and you have thresholds, right? Two of these three things have to be true kind of thing and you can nest them arbitrarily. With covenants, you no longer have this kind of compatibility. So you might have a covenant like a vault that's restricting your coins to only going to a certain address after a certain amount of time. You might have two of those. You have a covenant, a vault that does that, and a vault that goes to a different destination. Now if you do an and of those two vaults, you actually have an unspendable program, right? Because these are incompatible requirements and the scripting engine is requiring both of them to be true at the same time. So immediately you, you lose this composability. And what's frustrating is that this doesn't it doesn't matter what specific uh, covenant construction you're using. It doesn't matter what script opcodes you're using. Like this really is like these two things are conceptually incompatible with each other. Like with time locks. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, so technically we had something quite similar uh, that was actually a technical accident related to time locks. Uh, do, do you want to describe that real quick? Yeah, well, uh, yeah. Uh, so basically with time locks, it's very similar to a covenant. Just with a covenant, you're going to restrict the output of the transaction, but with the time lock, you're going to restrict some field in the transaction, but there is only one field, and the time lock can be of two types, two different types, either a timestamp or in number of blocks. And so you could have this end combinator that Henry was talking about between a timestamp and a block, and it just cannot be expressed uh, in the two at the same time, so the script becomes unspendable. Yeah, so we discovered that actually kind of a little bit late in the game. And it's probably good that there were a few years before wallet developers started using this. Um, and then in the end, we basically had to, to patch Miniscript to say you're only allowed to use one kind of time lock, because if you use both, then things might be incompatible. 
Um, so with covenants, this just inherently, it doesn't, it's not a consequence of, you know, Bitcoin using time locks in kind of a weird way where it turns out that there's two incompatible implementations. It's just conceptually, if you're requiring your coins to do X and you're requiring your coins to do Y and those are not the same thing, then, uh, then it doesn't matter what your implementation is, you've got a problem, basically. So the Miniscript composability model kind of breaks down. And so we get kind of a weaker form of composability where from, in a technical sense you're able to build these scripts and you're able to see, oh, this script is, is you know, an and of this thing and that thing. And that's pretty useful if you're a wallet author and you're a developer and so on, that you're not dealing with a script like opcode model where you're shifting things on the stack and you don't know that you can have like spooky action at a distance where one set of opcodes is like wrecking the input for another set of opcodes and, and so on. That's useful. But you no longer get to the kind of nice assurance where as a countersigner, I just say, I put my signature and whatever, and I don't even care what the whatever is. That's no longer true with covenants. And so that makes a lot of the kind of analysis that Miniscript enables all of a sudden much harder or potentially impossible to do. You can't just take a Miniscript and say, well, what is the minimum number of keys needed to sign this? Or what's the maximum number of keys? What's the maximum witness size? How many fees is this going to cost? Um, at time zero, what does this script change if I like just like cancel out all the time locks? Uh, these kind of questions are very useful questions to answer and, and often they have like the user meaningful um, um, interpretations that you'd like to expose this to a user and now you can't do that because certain kinds of Miniscript constructions might just be incompatible with asking these kind of questions and you're, you're back um, not quite to the pre-Miniscript like you've got this, this stack machine and trying to reason about days but you're kind of back into the doing ad hoc analysis of individual scripts, which is yeah. a bit of a frustrating thing. And, and, and this analysis may, might be crucial. If you're, for instance, if you're using a pre-signed transaction protocol, you definitely want to know the size of the spending transaction in advance to prepare for fees, uh, for your fee bumping strategy, for instance. So, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. As we're kind of wrapping down to the end here, just at a high level, if the open source stage, people here that are writing code and playing with this, um, how would you suggest kind of the ways to start actually using this in general? It's like well, an approachability, if you want to start messing around with some mini script powered output descriptors and you want to start using the policies, like what would be your action on where to look? Well, I would chill my wallet, but uh, so if you want to, as a user, if you want to try a, a mini script using project, you can, you can try a Liana. Uh, as a developer, I would go uh, toward BDK, as a BDK project is really making it easy for developers to use this, uh, this more advanced scripts and they've got bindings in different languages as well. So. That's, I mean, we use BDK at Anchor Watch and it's been massively uh, powerful in allowing us to have this accessibility because it's built on top of Rust Bitcoin and you know, Rust Miniscript, which is like libraries that you know, Andrew, you maintain. So it's uh, been really powerful to actually bring this to the people and make them have better programmable money. Yep. To, oh. yeah. Please, yeah. uh, I'll add a third category. So yeah, if you're a user or a developer, like yeah, I think that's, that's a great answer. You're also welcome to contribute to Rust Miniscript. If you're a mathematician, there's also a lot of stuff that can be done in the Miniscript uh, world. So a lot of the analysis that I've been hinting at, there are actually interesting open problems there that we're not quite sure how to solve. So one is if you have two Miniscripts and you know you can satisfy one of them, can you automatically satisfy the other? And this is something important, like in, in Liquid we have when we change our federation set, we want to make sure that the old federation, sorry, that the new federation is able to sign for the old federation's coins. So that during the transition time, you don't have this hard cutoff where like maybe nobody for a block or two can, can sign things. This is called entailment in general. Does one policy imply the other? That's called entailment. Right now, the only algorithm we know how to do, the only way we know how to do this in general is an exponential time algorithm, which quickly becomes extremely slow if you don't use some special ad hoc analysis for your particular problem. Um, another fun set of questions um, which relate to wallet design and protocol design are if you are trying to estimate the, the size of a Miniscript witness, your, your fee count, and you know that you have certain keys available, this might be cheaper than if you don't know if those keys are available, right? You always have to figure out the worst case. So if you know a key is available, then your worst case is better than if you didn't know it was available. And maybe you know that some keys are not available. And maybe you know that some keys might be or might not be. It turns out if you have any two of those categories, it's a very efficient algorithm for deciding the worst case. But all three, it becomes exponential time again. And this doesn't feel necessary. So if you're like doing a master's degree or something and you want to explore these open problems, please show up on, on Rust Miniscript and 
ask about it. So we are well over time, but maybe yeah. I should add, uh, we couldn't go into much of the nitty gritty details of the implementation of actual Miniscript, but there is plenty of stuff that could be fun uh, as a developer if you're interested. Feel free to bug me, I'll be at the LNS 10 yeah. just uh, on the way. Absolutely, yeah, and uh, if you go to miniscript.com, it actually redirects to Peter's original website with kind of all of these fragments and kind of an introductory level of what this problem is and what it's trying to solve. And uh, if you're a user and you wanna play around, check out Liana Wallet. Um, Trident Wallet uh, is also available as well for testing. And uh, also, if you're a mathematician, get deep in the weeds <laughs> and help us kind of bring us to the next level of optimizing. Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. Yep, thanks. Thank you, Miami, for the last three years in this amazing city. The whole world shut down, but Miami welcomed us with open arms. We want to show Bitcoin to the whole world. We are taking the conference on the road to set the stage for Bitcoin in a new city. Nashville. Bitcoin 2024 is coming to Nashville in Tennessee, a city that is known as a music and freedom city. Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville from July 25th to 27th.